start this evening with a piece of toast. The toast is one of the items that I'm responsible for in my day job as an archivist at the University of Bristol's Theatre Collection. The Theatre Collection is a museum and archive open to the public, as well as students, which looks after all kinds of archives and objects related to British theatre and performance. The toast is one of several that were made in 1994 by Nottingham students Julie Flowers and Rosalind Howell and used to advertise their show, Grill, A Piece of Toast, which they were going to perform at an open audition, hoping for a slot in the National Review of Live Art. Whilst their show didn't get selected, the slice of toast did end up finding its way into the theatre collection. Now, for archivists, preservation and access are the two things foremost in our minds when we're thinking about how best to manage the items in our care. What, am I, what I am asking myself is this. What needs to happen in order to preserve this item so that its content will still be accessible in, say, 100 years' time? Now, for those physical paper-based archives that make up a good deal of what we, looked after, we look after, it's reasonably straightforward. Typically, we start by removing anything potentially corrosive, replacing rusty steel paper clips and staples with brass ones, which don't rust, for example. Or we swap out acidic plastic poly, poly pockets with acid-free sleeves before placing these within a sturdy box. And then that then gets located in a secure, strong room where we maintain a stable environment. So safely kept like this, we can be confident that most items are going to withstand occasional handling with little risk of damage or deterioration. Of course, this archival mindset is different to those who create the items in the first place, who normally don't have to consider the durability of the things that they create beyond the relatively short time frame they're needed for. In theatre, this might be the deadline for the pu publication of a publicity or press photograph, the costume designer's sketches and swatches as they work out how the texture, colour and movement of fabric can help develop and reflect a character or the set designers painted cardboard models used to explore the action, how the action might take place on stage. And we'll come back a bit to this later. Or the prompt scripts, an unbound and often heavily annotated copy of the play's script kept by the stage manager, which include all the notes and information that's required to run the show. The prompt script remains live over the course of a production as tweaks continue to be made even after the first night. But it's not required to last much beyond the final performance at the end of a show's run. In common with many other things within our culture, these items were not necessarily designed to last, but created to meet the immediate and specific needs of a defined set of users for a limited time period, before the company then swiftly moves on to the next production. Nothing gets put into the briefs for these behind-the-scenes creatives, that their work should meet archival considerations, my considerations, so that they might remain robust enough for use a hundred years later. And it's the same with the toast. Originally sprayed in varnish by Julie and Rosalind to try and add a bit of toughness, it was still only intended to last a few days in the run-up to the performance. Now, I find it extraordinary that something so fragile has lasted this long. But at some point during its 28 years, it has developed a large crack. And as it remains in danger of breaking completely into two, we don't want to move it unless we absolutely have to. But although keeping it still and sealed within protective packaging in a controlled environment helps preserve it, we're no longer able to meet the other archival concern for its accessibility. We look after collections so that they can be used. And archivists only really want to preserve things that they can make accessible. If access is going to remain impossible, it can be hard to justify spending time and resources on preservation. But this is where recent technological developments enabling the construction of three-dimensional digital facsimiles, which have the bonus of being able to be used in augmented and virtual reality, are proving really exciting for the archive and museum sectors.
The digitization technique to create the 3D model of the toast is called photogrammetry. Information from over 100 two-dimensional digital photographs taken from every angle were used with the help of specialist software to construct a three-dimensional digital frame onto which the colors and textures could then be overlaid. So as we move around the image, it retains much of the toastiness of the original. The result is that both the content is now much more accessible than it otherwise would have been, and the original is better preserved. Indeed, after we posted it on Sketchfab, which is a 3D web platform, Rosalind got in touch with us to tell us how she very clearly remembered sitting in her kitchen with Julie, burning loads of toast and carving words in them before spraying them with varnish, and how amazed she was that one of them still survived. But soon after we'd started experimenting with 3D digitization and Rosalind and Julie's piece of toast, COVID hit. General access to our physical collections was almost entirely restricted for over a year, which sparked some urgent thinking amongst the staff of the theatre collection about how we might continue to use digitization, and particularly 3D digitization, to create new opportunities for presenting our collections in more interactive ways than simply making copies available online. Historically, we, like most museums and archives, have relied on people coming to us. But with this option no longer available, how might we continue to sustain audience engagement without the need for visitors to be physically present in the building? And we were really struck during the COVID restrictions just how much young people were being left without opportunities to connect with museums and the theatre. And this pushed us to force us to focus on how we might be able to reach them to get our collections out and about without the need for in-person visits. Now, as a small museum, we've only got five full-time permanent members of staff. We're used to working in partnership with other organizations to share expertise, develop ideas, and deliver projects. So teaming up with our long-term partner, Bristol Old Vic, whose archive is held at the Theatre Collection, as well as immersive technology company, Zuba, we were awarded a digital innovation grant through the Museums Association to begin to develop some of our ideas. Now, whilst an audience experience of theatre is sort of primarily focused on the magic of what's happening on stage, and we've got a mass media that likes to concentrate on the star qualities of actors, directors, and writers, the complex behind-the-scenes skill sets required from a team of talented technicians artists and craftspeople in getting a production ready for performance largely remains hidden from view. The objects and archives held in the theatre collection can reveal these processes. They can shine a light on the importance of these roles beyond the performers which go into creating the experience of theatre. And we know through our conversations with schools and other organisations who work with young people outside of mainstream education that making visible some of the various career options available within theatre could be an important lens through which to make our collections relevant and engaging to them. We wanted to highlight the variety of backstage roles that exist and to tap into this demand for skills and careers-focused engagement. Could we create an immersive tool with which to explore the inner workings of theatre that might encourage young people to explore ideas around creativity and career options? The uses of archives don't have to be limited to who do you think you are kinds of historical research. They can be repurposed for many other kinds of educational and creative outcomes too. One of the strengths of the collections we hold at the Theatre Collection is the breadth of materials that demonstrate the processes of making theatre, as well as documentation and ephemera from the finished production, such as photographs, programmes and posters, things you might expect. So by playing to these strengths, using 3D digitized set models, costume designs, lighting and special effects, our project team would be able to set about creating a set of digital tools that could be animated and explored within an immersive environment. But the first task was to select our archive. Out of the hundreds of Bristol Old Vic production archives, we finally settled on the Babes in the Wood archive from 2000 which was the last pantomime to be performed at Bristol Old Vic, with the late, great Chris Harris playing the dame. 
Behind-the-scenes work is similarly complex, whatever the production. But as a team, we felt that Panto would have a broad appeal, be very relatable, and inject a sense of fun into the project. And the stage manager's production prompt script, or Bible as it's sometimes referred to, documented the production process in minute detail, giving a sense, as my colleague Harriet from Bristol Old Vic has described it, of not just of what every backstage role involves, but the day-to-day -day reality of doing it. Beautiful set design sketches sit side by side with notes scrawled on scraps of paper, asking someone to give them a ring when they get back from lunch. It also had a fabulous set of delicate and colourful set models designed by Colin Winslow, which could be digitised for playing with in augmented reality. The models themselves are so fragile, it wouldn't be safe for us to handle them in an in-person workshop setting. So my colleague Sarah at the Theatre Collection then sent a set about digitising several of the set models, of which this is one, which are often made from stiff cardboard and balsa wood, like the skip. For some reason, and I'm not sure why, each of the main characters in the pantomime had their own skip. This one, as you can tell from the bottom, belonged to the dame. In real life, the actual model is not much bigger than a matchbox, but once digitised, we can scale it up to become a life-size skip. And once Sarah had finished her work digitally capturing the models, these were then given to Zuba to start designing the augmented reality app into which they would be incorporated. And by the late spring of this year, we were ready to begin a sustained period of iterative testing. And this short, rough video shows an early version of how the augmented reality app works using an iPad and how it incorporates some of the set models and pantomime characters from Babes in the Wood. So it was filmed as it was being tested in the car park outside of Zuba's offices in Bristol and gives a sense of how you're able to position and move the set models and characters around on the stage in much the same way that the set designers might have originally played with the models to understand how different scenes could be blocked or how the characters might interact uh, with the set and how the whole might look to an audience. Now on the right-hand side, you can see the lights box, which now gives uh, users various lighting options. You're able to flood the set with warm or cool or coloured lights, or you can even add a strobe effect. And you can see, too, how moving the iPad allows the user to go around the back of the stage area, and how coming in close to the models reveals something of their construction, complete with the masking tape. The scale button at the bottom of the screen allows the size of the models to be adjusted, at Bristol Old Vic, Harriet had the rare opportunity to actually test, have one of the testing workshops inside the auditorium itself, which meant participants could scale up the models to something like the actual size of how the full sets would have been seen on stage, which was by all accounts an incredibly powerful immersive experience. Now, we've since added a budget function to the app and a selection of special effects. So every costume prop or set selection has a cost implication, and with only limited funds available, users have to make selections accordingly, as there are not enough funds to select everything. There are special effects on offer two, which include a smoke machine to create layers of mist, some pyrotechnic fireworks, and a trap door. You can choose from the characters you've selected which ones to disappear beneath the trap door, but you've got to choose carefully as once they disappear, you can't bring them back. Now, while Zuba worked on the app, we set about selecting other two-dimensional um, items from the archive, much of which had already been digitised, in order to produce facsimiles for an archival box to accompany the app. Materials in the box are loosely arranged following the timeline of a production. So set design sketches, plans and technical drawings are followed by costume designs and lighting plots, sound effects and rehearsal notes, lists of props and budget sheets, technical breakdowns and cue lists, and a series of production photographs. After these come copies of the prompt book pages, which correspond to the 3D digitised set models included in the app. So the book and the app have been designed together so that if workshop participants are feeling particularly ambitious, they can use the source materials found from the box to reenact different scenes from the pantomime in augmented reality. Each section is prefaced with an introduction, giving some background to the various roles and functions. 
and a selection from the nightly show report, often hilarious, together with a glossary of theatre terms, are included at the end. Now, well over 200 young people have already had the chance to experience Making a Scene, that's the name of the project, during its development. And we're really looking forward to, to introducing the finished workshop to several hundred more over the coming months and years. So, to sum up, the combination of COVID and recent rapid technological developments are conspiring to have a radical effect on the way we think about how we, at the Theatre Collection, can both preserve and make, our accessible, make accessible our collections for the future. I'm no, not suggesting that the experience of a digital surrogate can replace the magic of an encountering the original physical item from our collections. They're different experiences. However, a digital encounter can also be magical and inspiring, especially when access to the real thing is restricted. But finally, to return for a moment to preservation, the corresponding archival principle to access, a note of caution, preserving digital content is not easy. And right now, trying to get our heads around how to preserve three-dimensional digital content is proving particularly challenging. Ink, paper and card have survived here for hundreds of years. Three-dimensional objects have not been around for much more than ten. So it's going to be interesting to see which disintegrates first, the real toast or its three-dimensional digital surrogate. But perhaps that's the topic for a future talk. Thank you.